I knew very little about the game when I first saw a bit of footage of a cinematic that included Gina Torres. And I was like, okay, wait, you've got my attention. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the nerd cred is there. Definitely. I'm a, I'm a big fan from like Firefly and Angel oh and, and the rest yes. of that. And, so, and, and I wasn't at all prepared for her showing up in the game. So it was a, a pleasant surprise to say the least. Welcome to Rise Above, an original podcast series by Ascendant Studios, where we share insights and inspirations from industry-leading creators. I'm Tess, the Community Content Manager at Ascendant and your host. Today, we chat with Kevin Boyle, our executive producer here at Ascendant Studios. Kevin's led development teams on over 30 epic titles and DLCs over his many years in the industry. He got his start at LucasArts on The Dig, a game Steven Spielberg pitched to George Lucas. Later, Kevin led teams at Telltale that garnered unprecedented sales and acclaim, winning multiple Game of the Year awards and two BAFTAs. Now, he manages all of the incredibly talented developers working on our game, Immortals of Avium, launching July 20th. I'm so excited for you to hear his story. Kevin, thank you so, so much for joining us for this podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you a little bit about your experience in video games and the industry. So let's start at the beginning. What was your relationship with video games as a child like? Did your family and friends support your interests? I've always loved video games. And, you know, since my first exposure, which, which would have been Pong, going back a bit. And as a kid, we always had consoles in the house. And it was one of these things where my mother worked in real estate and when she would close a deal to celebrate as like to involve us in her success she would always buy video games as a part of that process of closing deals and so for us as kids it was great we were you know excited to play new games but also it, like you know for children it, it gave us a weird interest in my mother's professional success it was uh, so it was good all around you know my parents never played but they could see how much my brothers and I love games and, and were supportive of it from the get-go. That's really awesome. I bet that was kind of a, a way to gamify her work for her in a, in a funny way, right? She would get a reward for you guys or maybe to gamify it for you. It's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But it, it, really, it really did end in, you know, celebration across the whole household anytime <laughs> things were going really well. So. So it was a, a fun way to absolutely to gamify that situation. That's so cool. So how did you end up in the actual video game industry? Was it something you always wanted to do from the beginning, from when you were starting to play them as a kid? Yeah, I think, you know, it was Mega Man 2 was the first game I ever played where I'm looking at this game and I'm thinking about this crazy pose that he strikes in the air every time you jump. And that was the first time I connected the idea that somebody drew this, you know, it was somebody's job to make this happen. And that was just crazy to me at the time. Like all my conceptions about what a job was for an adult were mostly pretty normal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> run of the mill stuff. And at that point it was like, wait, people make these things professionally. I mean, the idea of that as a career that I could get into didn't really occur to me until much later. But I had always been drawing, playing video games, tabletop RPGs, and all of that kind of stuff. So, it, like it, when it started to look like that could be a possibility, I mean, it was something I was definitely interested in. I went to college for animation, actually, and uh, was contacted soon after graduating by LucasArts, which was my first games job. What an incredible entry! <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was it was really remarkable. The you know, I mean, I'm up in Canada, and they're like, "Would you like to fly down to California for a test and an interview?" Like, yes, please. <laughs> Don't mind if I do. I already knew a handful of people who were down there working at the time, so it was like I'm already connected to some folks there. I had just finished playing Day of the Tentacle, and was excited about you know the content, the games they were making. So it was, I mean, it was it was perfect. That sounds amazing. Well, I'm sure that some of some of the answer to the next question will come from that experience. But what are your top three favorite projects you worked on throughout your whole career? And why was each one so cool for you? Uh, top three favorites. And I'd say any of these is, you know, 
it's always a swirl of challenge and struggle and joy and fun. And yeah. so I guess the first thing I would point to is the first game I ever worked on, which was The Dig at LucasArts. You know, I was fresh out of college, just moved to California to work on this video game that's based on an idea that Steven Spielberg had pitched to George Lucas. And it was just, it was insane. And it seemed impossibly grand, but you know, at the end of the day, the process of, of making games was a lot more scrappy than anything I had in my head at the time. I, I'd love to ask you to expand on that. Can you elaborate on what that means? Like, how was it scrappy? I, I guess I, I had this idea that, that there was just a way of doing things that was figured out and established and, you know, that, that the teams were kind of going through the motions of this process that was all very well understood and laid out. And that's really, that didn't turn out to be the case so much in that there were a lot of questions that needed to be answered. There was a lot of figuring out a best path forward. There was a lot of kind of, you know, a lot of creative energy being poured into the day to day, you know, at all seats on the team. I mean, it's, it was remarkable to me that, you know, people could show up to this first job in games and kind of influence the way things are going, as opposed to, I'm, you know, I'm going to be a little cog in this big machine. It's like, no, it wasn't, it wasn't really like that. So I don't mean scrappy in any kind of pejorative way. I mean, I think scrappy is a positive aspect. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of feel like that about my job. <laughs> Because I'm I'm new to, I feel very new to the inside of the industry, right? I was a streamer for a very long time. I did work very closely with publishers doing podcasts and showcasing games and doing marketing stuff. But I was always kind of on the outside, maybe on the publisher side a little bit, never on the inside with within a development company. Um, and it's been so amazing to have a voice and and be able to really contribute in in not just a meaningful sort of cog part of the system way, but in a creative way where I my ideas get to become reality. It's it's wild to me <laughs> that I get to do that. Yeah, it's it's it I mean it was it was basically that same notion that that I found remarkable in my first games job. And then, you know, you your first time peeking behind the curtain, things aren't quite what you would expect. And and things are different with every development effort, but there are some things that are always the same. The second project I'd point to would probably be The Walking Dead. And it had its own kind of unique struggles. But the thing that stands out in my mind about that is that the way we were developing and releasing games at Telltale, we would have episodes out in the wild in the hands of players and still be developing late season episodes. And so when that game hit, the audience response was tremendous. It was a pretty unique setup where you're getting that back in real time while you're still working on the next batch of content you're about to drop to that same audience that's so ravenous for, for what you've given them already. You know, the kinds of feedback you can get late, you know, that's feedback on a completed game. And it's 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 going to have the perspective of someone playing something that's done, which, you know, is going to be a more, maybe a more informed bit of feedback than you can get earlier. But We've been doing usability testing since pretty early on. And, you know, it's the kind of thing that we are rinsing and repeating as the, as the game makes progress. And, you know, as developers, you, you lose the perspective of a player. Like you've seen this content so much, you play it like you think you're supposed to play it. You watch a dozen strangers uh, <laughs> pick up a controller and have a run at it. And you definitely get a different result. And, you know, you see people getting stuck on things that you would never get stuck on. You see people struggling with things that have become easy to you. So there's definitely a lot of, a lot of tuning and kind of adjustment, particularly of difficulty and the amount of guidance needed and the kinds of things players pick up on versus what they miss. And how do we underscore these things to make sure they're, you know, in front of mind for the player. So it's, it's been a, a very important part of our development process that we've, you know, we've come back to repeatedly. Yeah, the last thing I'd point to would have to be my time here at Ascendant. And, you know, 
I've had a chance to overlap with some of the people that I'm working with currently in the past and some really good people that were part of my attraction to Ascendant to begin with. And, you know, beyond that, the team as a whole has been fantastic here. Taking a big swing is hard work and doing it alongside people you trust and can lean hard on is, uh, it can be good fun. Definitely. <laughs> That's something I'm learning as a, as a new member at Ascendant. So our next question is a little bit gamified also, kind of an interesting thing. Just imagine you wake up one day and you face this apocalyptic game dev reckoning. A shadowy figure is demanding you prove your skill. What's the one example of your work that you show him? I guess I'd start with backing up from the specific course of action and wanting to know more about the shadowy end goal. This can't be the only step, you know, what's the end game here? And does emerging from the shadows and asking me to do things actually get him closer? And we might want to work on more specific questions that don't have me bringing something random to the table that might not advance those goals and, and break things down from there. <laughs> I think uh, kind of stepping back from a very specific step forward and kind of dissecting the best path to an end goal, I think is, is something I could help this shadowy figure with. That is a very executive producer, production lead kind of answer, and I love it so much. Yeah, you know. <laughs> What's been a hurdle or a hindrance that you've observed in your time in game dev, and how do you combat something like that or preempt it if possible? So something I've seen from time to time is that like meetings can sometimes take on a negative tone. And it can be difficult to steer out of that in the moment. And so, like if, if for example, that negative tone is in an executive review that's a room full of people looking at content, trying to figure out the best course of action to close, it can actually be more disruptive than helpful. And sometimes just kind of pressing the brakes on a process and figuring out the right forum to be able to have a more productive conversation about the best path forward can be the best thing to do. So I've done my share of like, just completely derailing meetings that aren't adding up to something helpful and saying, hey, let's gather with stakeholder X, Y, and Z in a smaller group, figure out where we're off course on this thing, and then set it back on the tracks. Sometimes it's really hard to get people out of a mindset or out of a train of thought. And so that's that's an incredible skill to be able to Absolutely. do Absolutely. I mean, going going through the motions that you've set up can be comfortable, but it might not be getting you any closer to where you need to be. So. I think having a willingness to kind of knock things over from time to time can uh, can be helpful. Absolutely. So changing course a little bit, it, throughout your career, part of that was working at Telltale, right? You you know worked there for a time. You worked on the Walking Dead series, um, which is an incredible series, <laughs> by the way. Um, but when Telltale shut down, you had already moved on to other projects before they you know had closed their doors. How did you end up finding your way to Ascendant Studios? My path to Ascendant is somewhat connected to Telltale's closure in that a number of great people I worked with at Telltale and, and elsewhere in the industry were already at Ascendant by the time I was in conversations with, with Brett and others. It was Dave Bogan who initially reached out to me, who is someone you know, I recruited into his first games job in 1995. So we go back a little bit, <laughs> but I also worked with Dave a lot at, at Telltale. And I knew Michael Kirkbride was here and Karen Peterson and a handful of other people I, I overlapped with. I mean, I was not inclined to shut down the conversation, but I was, you know, I was in another job and I was having a good time and doing well. And, but, you know, was willing to kind of hear things out. And it was at the point where Brett had put a couple of things in front of me to see what they were actually working on that my tune completely changed. I had like kind of this casual inter interest in the conversation and they showed me some of the game they were making. And I was like, okay, how do I, how do I make myself part of this? This needs to happen. So it was a bit of a, a bit of a turn at that point. Gotcha. Julia actually said something a little bit similar she said something because uh, she was another person that came from Telltale to Ascendant. Yes. And she mentioned something about how when she read 
the story that Brett had pitched, she was immediately sold and was just like, I, I have to be a part of this. <laughs> it's really cool that so many of us, because I had the same experience too, actually, when Scott told me the, the story and the pitch, I was like, uh, yes, where do I sign? <laughs> so Yeah, I, I knew very little about the game when I first saw a bit of footage of a cinematic that included Gina Torres. And I was like, okay, wait, you've got my attention. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the nerd cred is there. Definitely. I'm a, I'm a big fan from like Firefly and Angel oh and, and the rest of yes. that. And, so, and, and I wasn't at all prepared for her showing up in the game. So it was a, a pleasant surprise to say the least. I recently rewatched Angel and there's a moment where she's like mother henning or, or like kind of le leadershiping. Um, that's not a word, but she's talking to Connor in a way that reminds me so much of how she handles Jack. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. And I was like, whoever chose her for this role, whoever suggested her, her agent, somebody must have yeah. seen this and immediately thought she'd be perfect because it's so reminiscent. <laughs> it's interesting. So now Ascendant is working on a brand new IP that's pretty different from some of the things you worked on in the past. Has that been invigorating, exciting, scary? I mean, I'd say absolutely invigorating and exciting. I think, you know, working with Brett and Michael, our lead writer, I, as I mentioned, I'd worked with Michael in the past and kind of had a sense of, of what he was capable of. And so, you know, even before really understanding kind of what they had pulled together, I was already excited about the potential. So not so much scary, but definitely, definitely exciting. You know, there, there are challenges and advantages with original IP and, and the blank page can certainly be intimidating. But for me, as I was joining the team, that, that was a, a point of excitement for me. And the idea that there isn't like a playbook to look to and, you know, it requires a lot more creative effort to establish an original IP is absolutely true, but it also you know, gives you the space to find solutions that are the best for what you're trying to do and, and kind of not box you into the way things have been portrayed in another media. I mean, this is a game first and foremost. And so the, the way things are presented fit the needs of the game as something that's at the core of the IP. So that's that's been a great advantage for us. That's so cool. Are you really excited for your family, your kids to play it maybe? have an interest? Yes. Uh, well, my, my, it might not be quite the right genre for my daughter, but my, my son is already uh, helping us out with a bit of performance testing. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, was, I was absolutely excited uh, to get his eyes on it and get him all NDA'd and all that good stuff. Very cool. As our executive producer at Ascendant, what are the team practices you feel are absolutely essential? And are there any that you try to steer your team away from? Yeah. I mean, I, I think kind of I can I can I think answer both sides of that with this this one example, which is, you know, hire competent adults and then, you know, follow up by going ahead and treating them like they're competent adults, giving the team real information with context is important. And, you know, no producer tricks with fake targets, you know, ahead of the real target. No, we'll aim for this. And when we miss it, we'll hit here. And it's it's been something I've really appreciated about Brett and his level of honesty with the team and openness to kind of let the team know even like how decisions that aren't finalized are being considered and made and things that you normally might not hear from the CEO directly. It's always the case that your drop dead date cannot be the target for the team at large, but they get that. I mean, you can back up from that and talk about what it is you're trying to do and when it is things need to fall in line for you to get there in a way that's, that's really putting your cards on the table. And, you know, you can expect and insist that the team, you know, do what they can to help get there. I mean, that's, we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to do the same thing. We may as well understand what, you know, as a team, what the steps to get there look like. That absolutely makes sense. <laughs> so is there one game production rule that you feel is vital for 99% of game dev or games? Is there one thing you sort of double check or revisit if things aren't going the way you expect? Well, I guess I'd say things 
things don't ever quite go the way you expect. And that's <laughs> kind of part and parcel. I, I point to the idea that, you know, your, your plan doesn't include the things you don't know. It can't, right? So you plan for what you know. And, you know, and that that's for both challenges and for opportunities. Like if you want to double down on something cool, that's also something that's not yet in the plan. So it's not really the plan then is it right? Cause it's not, it, it's not completely inclusive. So the best you can do is, you know, make a sketch of a plan that looks as close as you can get to what you're trying to do and, you know, get new information and make a new sketch and rinse and repeat all the way through. And I guess it's like one of these, it's not some uh, exciting revelation for folks who are f familiar with agile development. It's kind of like the, a core tenant, but the idea that, you can't really map your way to the end because of the number of things you need to learn along the way, but you can do something that's representative of what you know now and just leave yourself space to change it. Being flexible is really important. <laughs> Definitely. That's cool. So can you think of a time when a more experienced dev took you under their wing, gave you some really good advice, inspired you in some way? I can think of a couple of cases where I've worked for people where I have actively taken pages from their playbooks. Like very early in my career, I worked with a guy named RJ Berg, who was very specific in his use of language and he would choose his words very carefully. And I was at a point in my career where I was still maybe a little more prone to running my mouth than I am now. And, you know, <laughs> and he would ask, he would ask, you know, pointed questions about, what I'm saying in ways that would make me reflect on kind of my choice of words. And it's something that, you know, both in my professional life and in my personal life, it's, it's stuck with me. So I'm thankful for that. And then a little later in my career, I was working with Jeffrey Stiefel, who was an executive producer at the time. And it was the first time I had worked with someone who was at the top of the team org, who's you know, whose primary focus was creating space for the team to succeed. And like, uh, you know, as opposed to like ownership of the details or, or, you know, kind of putting a stamp on things. And it was, it was effective, you know, it was, it got things done. It let his team feel a sense of ownership of decisions that they were able to, to make. And ultimately, you know, the buck still stopped with him. I mean, it wasn't, you know, certainly wasn't asleep at the wheel, but it was a, different way of managing a team than I had seen in the past. And um, I thought it was really effective. That's really, really cool. And it, it, I mean, it definitely seems like it's inspired your leadership style to a point, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's, you know, it's an approach that I can take that, you know, that makes it comfortable for me to pair with someone like Brett, who was definitely about the creative details. I, I don't have any urge to try and wrestle those from him. I'm here to make sure the team can deliver on his vision for this game. Very cool. So do you have any advice with all of your amazing experience? Do you have any advice for aspiring game designers or developers hoping to get into the industry now? I mean, the one biggest thing I'd say is make stuff, like make stuff that you think is cool, make stuff that has your perspective in it. I think being able to show both what you've done and your inspiration to do it and what are the things that make you tick it's all good and the worst case scenario is that at the end of the day you've got something cool that you built as a hobby that didn't get you closer to your goal then move on to the next thing that does it's like impossible to work on something any project i think that's a creative project and not learn something from it Right. Because even if you completely fail and it's like you look at it and you hate it, <laughs> you probably have an idea of why you hate it and what you did wrong and what you would change the next time you work on a project. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, if if you're going to learn from mistakes, go ahead and get those mistakes out of the way. Yeah, right. <laughs> totally makes sense. That's really good advice. So just for fun, as a bonus, we'd like to end the episode with like a a little gamified kind of final segment so you have two choices i can ask you for your favorite character loadout or i can ask you your top five favorite games you've played ever oh okay <laughs> or i can ask you for both 
So, I, I mean, <laughs> my, my favorite loadout is a, it's a bit of a trap question because I'm a sucker for DPS builds and always fall into this trap of building out glass cannons that was never my intention to begin with. So maybe that's a bad one. <laughs> okay. And let's, let's go with top five. Okay. So I would start with, with Mike Tyson's punch out going back to the NES. And yes, Super Punch-Out is the better game, but this is the one that I feel the most nostalgia for. So that's top five. I'd say Final Fantasy Tactics is definitely top five. You know, really fun class progression, character and party development, uh, enough kind of freedom to completely break the game balance in ways that are super interesting and fun. I would have to include Counter-Strike, and not because it's my favorite first-person shooter, but, you know, a long time ago when LAN parties were still a thing, I was, you know, working at LucasArts on this corporate LAN that was fantastic, surrounded by people who loved playing video games. And so, you know, when we would clock out for the day, it was time to lock and load, and it was basically a LAN party every day after work, and it was fantastic. That sounds so awesome. It, it really was. I mean, I, you know, I got to the point where I would sometimes come in on the weekend and there would be, you know, people there just for the sake of playing Counter-Strike on the, on the corporate network. It was, <laughs> it was remarkable. Nice. I would have to point to Skyrim as a top five. And, you know, maybe the correct answer should be Oblivion, but this is the Elder Scroll, Scrolls game that I squeezed every drop out of. So, so in terms of my time spent, you know, Skyrim is the one that I really, that I really uh, poured everything into. And I would also say more recently, Elden Ring, both because I absolutely love that game, but also I didn't think I was a fan of FromSoft. And, you know, I had tried a few FromSoft games in the past and they punched me in the face hard enough that I just kind of walked away. And I didn't intend to play Elden Ring. And the buzz was just so positive. I was, you know, in this mode of, okay, let's see what all the fuss is about. And I was just completely sucked in. Played through twice. I mean, it's, yeah. So definitely top five. And then maybe honorable mention, I'd throw in Darkest Dungeon, which, you know, this Lovecraftian fantasy turn-based party roguelike with a Plague Doctor class. I mean, come on. <laughs> If you're on an airplane with a laptop, it just does not get any better. That's a, a personal favorite that I keep coming back to. Very, very cool. Well, thank you so, so much for being a part of the podcast, for answering all of my crazy questions. I really appreciate it. And I know our audience will appreciate it too. And I know our team really appreciates your leadership. And I'm so excited for the world to see what you guys have all been working on. I can't wait. I can't wait for everyone to see. You and me both. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Tess. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Rise Above. We look forward to bringing you more insider conversations with game industry leaders. If you enjoyed the listen, we'd love for you to rate and review the show. It helps so much. Please subscribe for future episodes. Check out our website at AscendantStudios.com to keep up with the game we're making and find us on all socials as Ascendant Studios. You can also sub to our newsletter, The Stand Up, to get bonus insights from the developers we talk to on this show and more. We'll be back soon with more insightful, one-of-a-kind conversations with some of the most experienced and successful game devs in the world. For now, this is Tess, signing off. <laughs>